already. So it's 6.32. I'll, I'll start doing some, some introductions. As everyone can see, I am not Jenna, unfortunately. Um, I'm Charlie Thrift. I'm the Teen Programs Manager here at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History and Sea Center. Um, so as the Teen Programs Manager, I get to run all of our awesome teen science programs, including Quasars to Sea Stars. Um, Sarah, our speaker tonight, and myself, and Lily, who is operating our chat tonight, um, all have something in common. We were all, well, Lily is still in, but Sarah and I both graduated from the Quasars to Sea Stars science program. So I'll let, I'll let Sarah talk a little bit about, um, you know, what that program was in terms of her, her experience as a scientist. Um, but if anyone knows teenagers who might be interested in getting, getting involved at the museum, we are currently taking applications. Um, and applications for all three of our teen sci science programs will be due April 22nd. Um, so feel free to uh, you know let some people know, spread the word. I think we've got we've got something coming coming your way in the chat with more info about the about the teens page. Alrighty. Wow, seventy participants. This is so fun. Okay, um, welcome everyone to Science Pub from Home. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, even though it is still light outside and there's um, some fun some fun windy weather to explore, maybe. Um, science Pub from Home, Phytoplankton, Indicators of Change in the Santa Barbara Channel. Um, we are very happy to have Sarah with us today. Um, and Science Pub will be taking a brief hiatus during the month of May, but we will be back with even more science. Um, and you can choose how much pub to include since it is from home. Um, June 13th from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. Um, and you can find more info about that um, on the museum's website coming, coming soon. Um, as always on our Science Pub from Home Nights, you can continue to support your favorite local businesses like our very own museum store and Dargan's Irish Pub. Um, and I just wanted to quickly tell you about a couple of things going on at the museum before I introduce Sarah. Um, planetarium shows at the museum are back in action on weekends, um, Saturdays and Sundays um, on the hour from 11 to 3. Um, Sundays uh, noon are our um, all Spanish shows. Um, so there's more info about that on our website, um, and those are included, um, the price of those is included with admission, just regular, regular visitor day. So come on in and check out the planetarium on weekends. Um, our John and Peggy Maximus gallery will be hosting some really pretty awesome lithographs of hummingbirds pretty soon. So that exhibit will be starting May 6th and continuing through the summer. So be sure to check that out once it's open. All right, housekeeping. During Sarah's presentation, feel free to send questions in in the Q&A um, box on the Zoom webinar. So it's at the bottom of your screen. If you can't see it, it's on like a little toolbar, toolbar at the bottom. It says Q&A. If you still can't find it, just find any young person near you. They will, they will help you out. Um, all righty. Joining us tonight, Sarah Marie Amiri. Um, Sarah was lucky enough, in her words, to be advised by some pretty terrific um, museum scientists with the Quasar to Sea Stars program in her early years. Um, when she was first thinking about, you know, collecting and thinking about phytoplankton in the Santa Barbara Channel. That experience later prompted a decade long exploration of how phytoplankton may be shifting in the Santa Barbara Channel under anomalous conditions. So Sarah is now using some deep learning techniques um, and deep learning networks at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography down in San Diego, um, studying how ocean processes may be influencing our atmospheric chemistry. Um, but Sarah still returns to Santa Barbara to the Santa Barbara Channel um, each month to identify what is blooming near the islands. All right, thank you for joining us tonight, Sarah. Please, when you're ready, take it away. Thank you so much for that introduction. It was beautiful. And gosh, in the chat, let me know if the waves get too loud because wow it is really windy out here um but thank you so much for having me i am delighted and uh everyone can see my screen is that right lily uh, yes looks great nice i just want to start by saying that lily is a fantastic quasar alumni she was i was working with her last summer on these harmful algal blooms um, and detecting them in the santa barbara channel and yeah, what an incredible program. I feel so lucky to be here and particularly this pub night uh, because, yeah, I spent all of my teens at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History and the Quasar to Sea Star program is everything to me. And yeah, I, some of my 
favorite early science experiences were at the museum and Patricia Sadegian and Paul Blanish Scott were my first science mentors. And yeah, I just, I don't want to get emotional, but this is very cool for me. So thank you so much. And um, I guess we'll just jump in. And, you know, if you have a burning question, feel free to ask it. I mean, I'm, I'm really open to that. Um, and then the chat is also great too. So Lily can ask at the end. Um, but yeah, so why are we here at this pub night? I am just very excited to talk about phytoplankton diversity and their role in the Santa Barbara Channel as bioindicators for change. And um, I want to welcome you to my culture collection. When I first started at the museum, I learned from Patricia early on how to cultivate a culture collection. Um, in that case, it was shells at the time. But in my case now with phytoplankton, basically drawing and cataloging all the different phytoplankton I've seen over the years. And what you're looking at is a bunch of local species from the Santa Barbara Channel. And um, in kind of a color-coded fashion, th there are three functional groups, but I first want to say what phytoplankton are. And it really, in, the, in Greek, phyto means plant, and plankton means drifter or wanderer. And so phytoplankton are essentially these photoautotrophs or these little micro plants that use the sun to get energy and photosynthesize. And um, here in the Santa Barbara Channel, we have three main types that we can see from, from space or from satellites. And that would be the blue coccolithophores, which actually, if any of you have been here, if any of you were here in Santa Barbara in 2015, the water just looked tropical blue. And that was because of these coccolithophores, these like chalky calcium carbonate, beautiful geometric um, organisms. And um, that also includes ferrocystis, which emits a lot of sulfur compounds that can make clouds um, and anti-clouds actually. And, um, and then we have the diatoms in the center. They're made out of glass and um, they're actually more, they're made out of silica and they're so diverse in the channel they're prolific it's a very dynamic system here in the Santa Barbara channel there's a lot of these guys and um and they really uh, build the landscape or the seascape here in the channel these diatoms and then lastly we have these beautiful dinoflagellates that can be sometimes toxic sometimes not they're pretty gorgeous they form red tides um and on a more global scale what what do phytoplankton really mean? Why, why do we care at all? Well, if you take Michelle Paddock's class at Santa Barbara City College, like I first did, my first oceanography class, um, she would have told you that they are incredibly important for biogeochemistry, which is just fancy talk for they're really good at cycling carbon and sulfur and nitrogen. Um, and what you see before you are these blooms from outer space that just like a wildflower bloom, like if you're at the Santa Barbara Museum, uh, or, oh, sorry. Yeah, if you were in like the Chumash Ethnobotany Museum section of where there's the gardens and it blooms, um, phytoplankton do the same exact thing. And you can see that on a global scale. And here you can see quite a few different types. This is phytoplankton modeled from MIT, the Darwin Project. And what they're basically doing is they're showing how different phytoplankton types bloom across the globe at different times of the year in different places. Um, and it can be quite beautiful, actually. It looks like a watercolor painting. And um, if we were to zoom in back into the Santa Barbara Channel, and um, this image is really dear to my heart. It's actually two different satellites took this image and then they merge them together um, in this harmonized image of the Channel Islands. And you can see all the different types of phytoplankton that are blooming in the water. And you can see some of those chalk makers that I was talking about, um, the coccolithophores and the diatoms in, in the center. And it's just so beautiful. And if you were to touch down and go into the surface of the water, of the seawater, and get a drop of water and put it under a microscope, you might see something like this. 
And this was the very first microscope image I, was, I took. They called them micrographs. And um, yeah, I first took this image. And what you're looking at are some dinoflagellates and diatoms, like I talked about, but also zooplankton, which are the animal plankton. And um, yeah, it's just what an incredibly diverse ecosystem we have here locally. It's always kind of um, awe striking, to be honest. And um, just to highlight that diversity a little more, these are polarized images, uh, micrographs of these different phytoplanktons. And um, yeah, I just want to show you all the different geometries and how outstanding they are. Um, we also have a prolific protus uh, population, uh, as well as zooplankton, microzooplankton. And they're really important for keeping these populations in check. Um, and yeah, they serve a very important role, but we'll be talking about phytoplankton mostly. So in this slide, after introducing what phytoplankton are, I always wonder, you know, in academia, they sort of train you to ask the how and the why. But sometimes I step back and I like remember my quasar days and I'm like, but like, what about the protection part? Do we need to protect phytoplankton? What's, what's going on? Are they threatened? Are they changing? Um, we hear a lot about climate change and ecological change in general, but a lot of these questions drive my research because I want to know regionally and globally, how are these different types changing? And more importantly, is it affecting diversity? And um, can we see examples of that in the Santa Barbara channel? And so to sort of get myself to answer any of those questions, we needed to build some kind of time series with, with the whole community of people, really. Um, you'll see near the end, there's gonna be a lot of shout outs. I mean, we have like 16 different collaborators and essentially um, we're all a group of people that collect phytoplankton all across the Santa Barbara Channel, whether that's with NASA on Plumes and Blooms missions, which I'll show you next, or at the islands with um, the very, very wonderful RV, RV Noah Shearwater crew, shout out. Um, they've taken some incredible samples or island packers, Santa Barbara Channel keeper. Um, I'm gonna miss a bunch of people, but yeah, it takes a whole team of citizen scientists and, and um, incredible nonprofits and institutions to, to figure out what's going on in the channel over time. Um, and so how do we collect seawater in the middle of the Santa Barbara Channel? Well, we go on to this fabulous boat called the RV Noah Shearwater, Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. And, um, oh, I think my internet's really slow. But anyway, um, yeah, that's, that's basically a CTD. So we're looking at conductivity and temperature and salinity. And basically this um, giant thing of water bottles essentially is grabbing seawater at a specific depth. And that seawater can later be analyzed for those little phytoplankton and, and measured back in the lab. Um, so that's a lot of fun. We do that all the way from the coast to the islands. And I did that for years and years and years on these fun monthly cruises. Or we're collecting seawater at the islands just off the pier. And that's always a lot of fun because it's like over a beautiful kelp forest and it's gorgeous. But here's a, a bit of a map of the places we collect. Um, yeah, Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary has been integral in these collections um, since I have been away more often. But Otherwise, interns will collect across the coast. Um, they'll collect at the islands, or they'll work with Santa Barbara Channel Keeper and island packers to make those collections happen. But yeah, it, it really takes a, a whole community here. And yeah, that's a map of different, different field sites. Oh yeah, well, before I go to that. So when I was a quasar, right? Let's say many, 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 many years ago. I was this quasar at the museum and I would start my talks talking about harmful algal blooms in the Santa Barbara Channel. And there's this one harmful algal bloom that Alfred Hitchcock was so interested in. 
And I would always start my talks like this at the museum when we had an annual get together. Oh, 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 sorry. Let's, um, so sorry. But yeah, Alfred Hitchcock was very charmed by this event that happened in the Monterey Bay where all these birds just started attacking people and themselves. And he figured out later that it was from this harmful algal bloom event um, by this diatom called Sidonychia. And Sidonychia causes this amnesic shellfish poisoning, which causes you to lose your memory. Um, and it produces a toxin called domoic acid. Anyway, um, he was very charmed by that event. And in 2015, we had, there's a connection with that, um, that event and these warming events that happened in the Santa Barbara Channel. And essentially in 2015, we had a major warming event called the Warm Blob. And essentially the whole war West Coast was just covered in this warm water um, sea surface temperature anomaly. And so what you're seeing there in the video is um, anal analogous sea surface conditions of almost four, sometimes five degrees Celsius over the norm, um, and which is very warm for our Santa Barbara Channel locally. What did that mean for the phytoplankton? Well, very interestingly, the same bloom I was talking about from Alfred Hitchcock, the birds, um, this is the same bloom, it was called Sudanichia, and it was a coast, west coast wide bloom all the way from Alaska to Baja. And it kind of looked like this from space. Um, and as you see, that's California. And all that green stuff is that spindly diatom, that Sudanichia that makes that domoic acid, um, which we call harmful algal bloom, because when it blooms in very, very high numbers or it increases um, exponentially, it sometimes, not always, produces a uh, produces that toxin called domoic acid, um, which can go through the food chain and affect public health. And, um, and it can also affect phytoplankton diversity. And so that's why I was very interested in it actually. Because at first I was very interested in um, thinking about the toxins in how that would affect the coastline from a public health point of view. But then once I looked at the numbers of phytoplankton and started delving into their community structure, I noticed that it really was affecting their diversity. And so that sort of from there led me to ask again, gosh, well, what, what blooms are occurring during these ecological changes? Um, or these climactic changes as well. Um, maybe today I could, you know, walk with you through these different case studies and sort of think about these blooms and how and when they bloom across the islands and, and the coast. And so um, that HAB event was really interesting. I know this graph isn't, it, it's, it's gonna be a little hard to read, but all you need to know here is when you see the lime green, that is the toxigenic bloom or the harmful algal bloom of Sudanichia. And, um, and there were other things in the water as well during that time, but it really filled the channel, honestly. And it was very detrimental to um, crab fisher uh, men and women. And um, it was very, very detrimental to the entire West Coast fishery, actually. It was a very difficult time. And I'm sure some of you will recall uh, just how bad that was in our community. But yeah, there were other things in the water that during that time we had some protist communities and some dinoflagellates um, and, and, and haptophytes, but mostly this very toxic bloom event. Um, another case study I wanted to highlight was after the mudslide event, um, if you recall going back to uh, 2017, Thomas fire and then the mudslide in 2018 in Montecito, very, very sad event for our community. Um, but very strangely, after this event, there was this proliferation of diatoms. Um, and according to the time series in these collections, there's always diatoms in March, that, that wouldn't be unusual. But these were, 
you know, three or four fold uh, more diatoms than than at least eight consecutive years. So I, I found that very fascinating. Um, and one thought I had was maybe maybe there was from the mud addition some some sort of leaching or or bioavailability to the these diatoms, but that's really just conjecture. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I wanted to highlight that. They're quite beautiful. Uh, and so what did that look like? That explosion of diatoms was really coast wide. That's why I want to highlight it. There were, of course, other things um, in the water, but the uh, diatoms really dominated that time. And now let's kind of fast forward to the 2020 red tide. I was really bummed because, well, I mean, we were all bummed. It was a terrible time, but um, specifically for this red tide in 2020, as we all know, very sadly, the world just shut down. And, um, and during that shutdown, a lot of science stopped as well. And so when that science stopped, a lot of the time series had to stop and a lot of, um, there's a lot of gaps in our data. For whatever reason, um, this enormous red tide event happened. The, the last one that was this big, and it wasn't even this big, was in 2005. And this red tide event uh, was caused by a very, very beautiful dinoflagellate called Lingulodinium polyhedra. And um, we called it L. poly for short. And L. poly uh, bloomed all the way to the mid-channel, um, not necessarily the mid-mid-channel, but um, to Anacapa and eastern Santa Cruz Island. And I was so lucky. The NOAA Shearwater crew, this outstanding crew, um, was like, yeah, we'll take samples for you. And that's a shout out to Jackie, Zach, and Captain Howard, Captain Zach. Yeah, I'm going to get that wrong. But anyway, I'm, I'm so delighted by them during a pandemic, I was able to get these island samples, and I'm just so grateful because I was able to catch this moment. And um, as I was saying, it takes a lot of citizen scientists to um, understand these time series events and collect data where data is scarce and very difficult to access by oceanographic boats. Um, and so one way I like to do this is, gosh, it's a pandemic. I can't get out on a boat right now. What do I do? Well, if I go on Instagram, I'm going to find out where the bioluminescence is. And that might lead me to know the spatial range of, of the red tide. Not necessarily, but it might give me a hunch. And so it gave me a great opportunity to reach out to others um, and think about this red tide because they have this beautiful thing that they do. Excuse me, I get really excited about phytoplankton. Um, but I'm really stoked about this because they have an enzyme called luciferase and it, it's a biochemical reaction inside of these gorgeous cells um, where they produce a little bit of light. They release um, some light and many of you have probably seen this in the crashing waves. And this was indeed in the Santa Barbara channel. And it was one of the prettiest events I had ever seen. Um, but yeah, anyway. So yeah, I just wanted to highlight that crew again, uh, Noah Shearwater. They were kind enough to collect that sample. Here, I'm just gonna, hopefully there's no sound. Oh, isn't that cute? That's a little zooplankton gobbling them all up really fast. Um, anyway, in the center here, we have Lily, the quasar extraordinaire in the chat box, uh, who actually did a lot of these collections uh, years later, and I just wanted to show that the same species does come up um, and come back often. And if she wants to speak about it, she totally can, but no pressure, Lily. I'll, I'll just put that out there. Okay. Oh, yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, oh, good. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Hi, my name's Lily, everyone, um, and I'm a current quasar. And in the photo in the middle, what you'll notice here is actually a high abundance of serratium and lingolodinium. So in my research, I realized that this high abundance was actually caused um, by extreme temperatures in the summer of 2021. And one thing that I did know is that they tended to actually 
become more abundant when there were extreme temperature differences. So that doesn't necessarily mean only hot. It was also when it was super cold as well. Um, so yeah, that's what you're seeing in that photo right there. Um, and kind of what Sarah was talking about, lingolodiniums are not usually toxic within themselves, but in higher um, congregations, they can become quite toxic. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, wonderful, Lily. Yes, honestly, um, her research is incredible. And it actually prompted me to format my talk this way, thinking about ecological change. So I have to thank her for a lot. Um, but yeah, I think that note Lily just said about toxicity, very interestingly, I didn't even say this, this particular red tide event. Um, so lingulodinium polyhedra can make yes a toxin, but that's more so in the Mediterranean. Although we have derivatives or analogs that make the same kind of toxin of yes a toxin, but there's some added molecules or some adjusted molecules. Um, and recently at Scripps, we have found that in the air. So it's very interesting. Um, and yeah, I also wanted to highlight Laura here. She goes out on the RV Noah Shearwater with the crew as well and organizes these really big school trips, um, education trips at the, at the Channel Islands and collects these wonderful samples. But there's El Poly again, and that, that's um, in 20, uh, 2019. Anyway, uh, yeah, so in thinking of these marine heat waves um, and these red tide events again, uh, I just wanted to show you the red tide event. The distribution was interesting because the El Poly on the coast, not necessarily the islands, but on the coast really stopped at Refugio Beach. It, it, it really, there wasn't much um, El Poly after that. There were more so many diatoms and some dinoflagellates and protists and haptophytes. Um, and then it, it really, honestly, it wasn't until you reached slow that you saw them again pop up, but more sparsely. And so anyway, the take home here is that we had a red tide event in 2020, uh, starting in March. And um, it was from Refugio Beach all the way to Baja, California. And I just find that so fascinating uh, and the only island sample we were able to get uh, was from Anacapa, but I, part of me thinks that there probably were less on, on the western side of the island. Um, oh, oh gosh, yeah, oh, I forgot about this bad boy. Okay, so now, now we're in 2022. And um, in 2022, March, there is this really interesting bloom that's popping up. It's a yellow tide by Akashiwo. And what an interesting phytoplankton. It's not a dinoflagellate. Oh my god, I'm gonna get this wrong. That's so embarrassing. Ooh. Um, can an expert please correct me if I'm wrong? I think it's a raphidophyte, but I'm not sure. Anyways, um, it, it is a phytoplankton that also can be quite toxigenic. And um, recently I was talking to the director of SCOOS, Clarissa Anderson, uh, Dr. Clarissa Anderson at Scripps, and she was saying they're quite harmful to bird populations. And right now they're blooming in the Santa Barbara Channel, um, but they're also co-blooming with El Poly, which we just discussed. It's kind of a yellow red tide in a way. And I just want to give the photo credit to um, uh, Dr. Green at Santa Barbara City College and Dr. Michelle Paddock, who recently collected this on the RV Noah Shearwater with the wonderful crew. Um, and that's sort of the distribution I'm able to get at this time. Um, the, I did not have a drawing for Akashiwo. It, it blooms so rarely. Um, anyway, I just put a couple circles. And um, the yellow is Akashiwo and the red is that El Poly, the red tide, yellow tide, superimposed. You have a lot going on in the Santa Cruz Islands along with the coast at this time. Yeah, so the last thing I think I wanted to highlight here in my case studies is um, there were quite a few indicator species across these different marine heat waves I was able to identify over time. And interestingly, they, they happen more so at Anacapa Island, honestly. And so what I was starting to notice is there were quite a few tropical species coming into the channel during these marine heat waves. 
and the the videos that I have are pretty bad. So I just put up funky drawings. And by funky, I mean, <laughs> yeah, these are mostly dinoflagellates. And in the center, there, there's the diatom, planktonella, sole, very beautiful diatom. And um, yeah, I think it's really fascinating to see what specific phytoplankton come up during marine heat waves consecutively, um, in which ones come up during certain parts of the anomaly, like over two degrees or three degrees or four. And I, I'm kind of using that right now in a model to sort of not forecast, but kind of understand and predict a little bit of how these temperature anomalies at certain degrees, what their thresholds are and you know what's in the water at that time. But these blooms fluctuate, they're dynamic, and they're very difficult to predict when you think about transport mechanisms um, and how the ocean flows and how it's, you know, mostly a mosaic of beautiful eddies and things are swirling around and coming from multiple directions. So yeah, it's quite difficult. Anyway, um, yeah, I know this is not that great to put up a plot or graph during a pub talk, but okay, just bear with me. So. Here, we're looking at some of the major functional groups we've been talking about, the different phytoplankton. And all I want you to do here is just look at their overall trend. That's why I didn't put cell numbers or relative abundance. Um, I just want you, if you can, just to look at the line within each color. There is a line in the center. And to look at their trend going upwards or downwards. Um, and basically, what the take home here for me in this research was during that big warm blob event where the west coast was just covered in this um, sea surface temperature anomaly, this big marine heat wave. We had a really, really, really low diversity of phytoplankton, but also low chlorophyll in general, low nutrients. Um, and so it was a time of very low diversity, to be honest. And um, the take home I see is that during marine heat waves, we have significant harmful algal bloom events, but it's not always the same one. And so um, here I just want to quickly highlight again with phytoplankton diversity um, that the middle where you see the downward trend um, in diatoms and dinoflagellates, they, their populations went down during that marine heat wave. That would be 2015 if I had added a timeline. <laughs> and then um, haptophytes are like the ones I could see, which are the really, really large coccolithophores and then phaocystis that seem to um, go start going down and not recover since the warm blob. So I found that very interesting. And by the way, these trends are for all of the channel combined. I average them. But if we were to look at them, um, from the islands to the coast to the mid-channel, you would see different trends slightly. Um, anyway, so what do I see with harmful algal blooms? Well, I see interestingly when the temperature anomalies are high but not too, too high, the diatom, the dinoflagellates seem to be doing very well, these red tide events. And this trend goes all the way to 2020, but if we were to add 2022, um, you would see it continue to go up. And then I kind of noticed that in that middle hump, if we're looking at the sort of brown red one below, the Sudnitia or diatom um, green tide, I, I found that um, those do really well in the marine heat wave, as I said, but they're actually, interestingly, and I could be very wrong because I didn't add 2021 or 2022 to this plot. Um, and, uh, but as far as what I see, from these trend lines, they, they seem to be going downward. So that's kind of interesting to me. Um, we're getting a shift towards the red tides over the green tides. Uh, yep, found that interesting. Oh yeah, that's, I don't know. Oh, anyway, so I guess my, my sort of question here for myself is, gosh, as these SST anomalies continue to become more prolific and be, more spatially and temporally frequent, you know, is this the landscape of the Santa Barbara Channel? Is this what we're gonna see? Like, um, and I don't know, I guess the answer would be that 
there's quite a bit of resilience actually, because if we're able to look at this, um, these trends, diatoms and dinoflagellates, they seem to be going upward in trend. So maybe there is some resilience after these marine heat waves that um, make things a little interesting for preserving diversity. And um, yeah, I guess, see if it works. Oh so, yeah, oh yeah. This is the last kind of funny thing. I, um, yeah, so the spring bloom in the Santa Barbara Channel is one of the most spectacular things you'll ever see. It is so beautiful. Just like that wildflower bloom, you know, like I was telling you, diatoms come up, then usually dinoflagellates, and then usually the, the cockles, of course. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's a very magical time. Um, and I encourage you all, when you're in the ocean next, I don't know, go to the sea center and pick up some seawater and look in their microscope because it's just fabulous right now. Anyway, oh yeah, we're gonna go through it, okay. And so anyway, I was saying that uh, it takes a lot of different people to make these time series work and to get this kind of data. And so I've been working on a website for a long time with interactive features, but it's still under construction. I'll make sure to, I don't know, let Lily know when it's ready and maybe we can reach out. But there'll be some community pages and, and interactive maps and data. Um, but I also really want to highlight um, Mike Maniscalco from UCSB because he does all the counts for scoops and, um, and he's developed this really cool R shiny uh, page where you can interact with the data at Stern's Wharf and look at different harmful algal bloom events and um, along with sea surface temperature and nitrate. And yeah, so that's kind of incredible. He does quite a bit of research on diatoms for his PhD and was kind enough to let me um, steal this from his GitHub page. So yeah, check it out. Lastly, I kind of just wanted to conclude with some kind of either a community discussion or a tangent later. I think one thing I also wanted to highlight that isn't an official case study because I'm not done with that research is I found that during sediment loading in some of our local beaches like here in Galita Beach, um, when sediment goes into the seawater, what, what I noticed from my studies in the time series was I had been monitoring Galita Pier for like six years. Um, and then the times when there was sediment loading and they were putting sediments in the seawater, a lot of that has ash or um, other sediments from all over, all sorts of different watersheds. I found that mobility was really, really a problem for the phytoplankton. They couldn't move, um, especially the dinoflagellates that had, uh, have flagellas or ciliates that have cilia. It was really difficult for them to move with the particles of sand and. Anyway, it's a discussion I want to have that you know, what we do locally on our beaches can sometimes really impact phytoplankton in different ways. And um, just something to think about and discuss at our city councils, which I know I will be doing at some point soon. <laughs> and um, with that, gosh, I just have to thank everyone. But how do you thank everyone? I don't know. I, I'm trying. Um, well, let's see. Here are the decals for everyone. I, I have to go through this. They are so integral to this entire uh, entire group. So we've got Coastal Fund, who has been funding us for years, Island Packers, Santa Barbara Channel Keeper, SCOOS, California Department of Public Health. Oh yeah, National Marine Sanctuaries, Channel Islands and National Marine Sanctuaries. Great place. Um, and then the Sea Grant and uh, got a, Shout out to all these people, you know, wonderful humans. Uh, yeah, that's the RV Noah Shearwater crew again. Uh, Laura, Carrie Culver, Dr. Dave Siegel, who um, is the PI of Plumes and Blooms for the NASA cruises. Great guy, great, wonderful human. Um, oh, and then there's Lily, who's in the chat box. Please give Lily some love in that chat box. Just tell her she's wonderful because she's fantastic. She also just got accepted to Berkeley and UCLA, and I'm so proud of her. And um, these are some of my interns as well over the years. Lovely human beings. Um, yeah. 
And then uh, just a shout out to everyone who's ever mentored me at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, um, in Santa Barbara City College before UCSB. You know, I had this whole time where I myself was a citizen scientist and that's how I started. That's how it all started for me. And so I can't thank Patricia Sedagian and Paul Blanner Scott enough and all the lovely people you see here, Dr. Paddock, and Dr. Green um, and Jenna. Oh, and Terry Sheridan, oh my gosh. Okay, I have to do this. I have to do this. It's a pub talk. I, I think I'm allowed. Um, you have to go to the library at the Museum of Natural History. It's fantastic. Terry Sheridan will give you the book of your dreams and you'll leave and you'll be like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Anyway, great human. Um, yeah, that's, that's where I'm going to leave off and take any questions or thank you so much for hearing me talk so fast. I'm freezing. It's like, let me just show you guys. Can you see this? Anyway, I'm ready to take questions. Well, nice job, Sarah. This was very fun. And thank, oh, thank you. you. Thank you so much for sharing your sharing your work. Well, thank you so much for listening. All right, we've got we've got a lot of questions coming in oh. in the QA. There's some in the chat too. I'll let I'll let Lily go ahead and maybe pose some questions to Sarah. But I also just wanted to quickly say, you know, if if either Lily or I were presenting our sort of our research and stuff, Sarah would would be on our thank you slide. So it's it's really fun to have oh. Sarah here tonight. Um, she was a mentor to me when I was a Quasar. She's a mentor to Lily. So, all right. Do you want to do you want to ask some questions, Lily? Gosh, I'm so honored. Thank you. <laughs> Did you say you wanted me to ask some questions? Yeah, go go for it. Oh, okay. Um, well, actually, it was kind of funny because in trying to answer some of the Q and A questions, I answered one person's question, but then it kind of made me question it a bit more. One of the earlier questions somebody asked, um, does the water temperature affect the amount of bioluminescence that occurs? And I believe in some of my research I was finding, um, it's kind of like if overall phytoplankton bl blooms occur, then bioluminescence will also increase. But what do you have to say to that, Sarah? Would you say there's a connection between the two? Yes, I would. Very good question. Actually, it's a fantastic question because it's not always the case. Some, some species you don't need a lot and there's quite a bit of bioluminescence and you're very surprised when you see it. You're like, oh, wow. But um, the one I was talking about, Lingulodinium polyhedra, L. poly, you know, what we saw with all the bioluminescence recently, that's 10 to the fourth cells generally, or like almost exponential, almost blooming. So. Sorry, I have all my notes flying away. Um, but yeah, so you don't need too much, but during those really peak bioluminescent events, you're gonna get um, exponential growth is generally the best time to see that. Two hours after sunset, yeah. And gosh, if you're willing, go to Malibu, you know, in, in the week, next couple of weeks, it's gonna be beautiful, yeah. So we have another another question in the Q&A, Sarah, is um, is the health of phytoplankton a good indicator of the overall health of our ocean? Oh man, gosh, Lily, do you want to answer that? That's like, that was like your talk. I would just want to oh. give you that opportunity. Oh, thanks so much. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's actually a really great question. Um, so phytoplankton are usually kind of known as almost being the building block of the ocean. Um, when you think about the food chain, they're not technically the very first, but they're close to it. Uh, because of this, they can be a great indicator. Um, a lot of some of the environmental factors that affect phytoplankton are simultaneously affecting other animals. For instance, um, pH, so the acidification of water, um, temperature as we pointed out. Um, so generally, if you look at those, if you look at the, some of those factors, um, you can sort of start to infer how that's also impacting other animals as well. Um, and also mo more particularly, if there are any issues, for instance, with an increase of toxic phytoplankton, this can also be seen in communities where there is, um, I can't remember the exact name, but it's where there's actually mass fish deaths. 
Um, and so these are, can be some of the indicators that this is happening is a ton of fish or sea animals getting poisoned because of toxic phytoplankton. Um, so yeah, they can definitely be really helpful in examining that. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that, Sarah. Yeah, I, I love your answer, Lily. I think the take home for me is always the same. Um, you know, phytoplankton di diversity matters so much, just like in any ecology. You know, you can think of any ecosystem and the diversity is what really feeds health um, and longevity and mortality. They, I think the answer to that question on my end would just be, what type of phytoplankton? Not just how much. That's why chlorophyll A from space is just not enough. We need to know what type of phytoplankton is in the water and what its functional role is. Like, can it make clouds? I don't know. Can it, does it produce toxins? Does it produce more carbon than other ones? Or can it sequester carbon? Can it, you know, influence the nitrogen cycle? So yeah, these are all questions that I ask constantly. And yeah, it's, anyway, great answer, Lily. Yes, and great question. Okay, um, and looking at some more of the questions, I'll just pick some random here. Um, oh, this one's kind of interesting. So somebody asked earlier, the, I'm always terrible at pronouncing the name, Akishiwo? Yeah, Akashiwo. Akashiwo bloom was rare. Is there any correlation with temperature of pH? Have you seen any thresholds where once past a certain species blooms? Kind of what we were just touching on a little bit earlier, acidification. That's so interesting. Um, I know that there are a lot of experts on here because I've invited them and they've been very kind to, to go to this pub night. I, I almost want to ask the experts because for me, when I think about pH, um, I think about a lot of things. I think about resilience in some species over others like diatoms do really well and they're mostly fine. Um, Whereas I'm not sure about Akashiwo. It's a great question. And if someone has an answer, it might be a good frontier for someone to Google Scholar it, or I could get back to you and ask some experts. I'm not sure. It's a really good question. But the reason why it's such an important question is, as we all know, as PCO2 goes up um, and carbon systems change, um, alkalinity and um, anyways, as our pH changes uh, in our global and regional ocean, we think about things like pH. How will that affect our phytoplankton? How will that change the seascape of certain regions over others? Very, very good question. Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, another question here I'm seeing is, with the shift you're seeing in abundances of different groups of phytoplankton, do you expect there to be cascades across the food web? Um, i.e. are some phytoplankton better for grazers or um, than others? Yes. Oh my gosh. This is, ooh, I'm really excited for this question because I'm pretty sure Mike Maniscalco is um, somewhere in, in this pub. Anyway, him and General and I all took the same oceanography class at UCSB together. It's this really great class taught by Mark Brzezinski at UCSB. And he, he was sharing with us that some copepods and microzooplankton prefer um, non-salacious, so like not diatoms. But then I've been told recently um, at Scripps that, that it just really depends actually. So like all these microzooplankton, like these different things, they all have these different functional roles. And some of them like the chalky stuff over the glass stuff, over the cellulose stuff. So um, it's variable. Don't know how to answer that one particularly, but it depends. <laughs> okay, great. Um, trying to choose a question so randomly. And it looks like we have a lot of interest in bioluminescence. And so person's asking, so is the same phytoplankton that causes red tide the same that is bioluminescence? Oh man, that is a terrific question because most red tide species do produce bioluminescence, but, but some don't. Um, and honestly, the, one of the reasons we don't see a lot of bioluminescence here in Santa Barbara as much as let's say at Scripps, 
where it has warmer waters, more stratified, more tropical influence, um, is, yeah, we don't really get as many numbers of those types of bioluminescent um, red tide events. But now it looks like, at least from this preliminary data, we, we might see more in the future. But yeah, to answer your question, not all dinoflagellates have bioluminescence, but um, many of them do. And the ones that do are mostly, um, they are able to do this through that luciferase uh, enzymatic um, uh, biochemical reaction. Yeah. Sarah, um, still ready for some more questions? Oh, yeah. I was just thinking, you know, I got some diatoms right here. It's kind of fun. You, you know, when you're in the lab, you can grow stuff see what happens to it, you know, nice. do some fun studies. But yeah, I'm, I'm ready. I would love more questions. An interesting question, actually. Is there any evidence of phytoplankton evolving in the fossil record? Oh, yeah. Oh, I bet, I bet Jenna would want to answer this. I also want to give a shout out to Jenna because I think she just got married. So congrats to Jenna uh, Roll. She um, would be excited to answer this because she studies fossils and um, diatomaceous earth, I don't know if any of you garden um, or use it for other things, but diatomaceous earth, oh yeah, Darla, you go. Um, yeah, it's made of mostly diatoms, which also a lot of our fossil fuels are made out of diatoms. And um, yeah, you can find those in the records. You could also find coccolithophores. Um, and actually, you can find many, many phytoplankton also with um, other tracers, isotopic tracers and um, DNA tracers. So yeah, the answer is yes, you can see them in the fossil record. And there are some excellent papers that show like prehistoric phytoplankton communities and how they bloom at different times. And ah, they're so cool. I would do anything to go back in time and like see a prehistoric diatom. What would that look like? Oh my God. Anyway. What do you got for me, Lily? Yeah, that's all. I didn't even know that we had records of phytoplankton. I know I'm supposed to know that, but I did not. <laughs> but uh, um, another question I'm seeing here is, can you see the yellow tides as prominent as the red tides? Oh, yeah. Actually, maybe we could see in the chat what people say. But let's say two weeks ago, was anyone in Ventura like surfing or, gosh, I don't know, fishing, chilling, you know? I don't know. I was. I, I was in Ventura a couple weeks ago and I saw this giant yellow, uh, beautiful strand across the ocean. And I was like, oof, that is bad. And it stinks. It really smells. And what, what I was smelling was some of those sulfur compounds I was talking about. And they're quite aromatic because dimethyl sulfide it has that sort of sweet sulfur smell. It's not the sulfide one where it really reeks and you're like, ugh. That's terrible. Um, but anyway, so I felt compelled to go with all my clothes on and take my sampling gear and just go in the water. And I didn't have a boat, so I just did it. And um, yeah, so I, I saw the Akashiwo then during a in Ventura two weeks ago. And then Santa Barbara City College went on the Noah Shear water and confirmed that it was at the islands um, about a week ago. So yeah, and shout out to Adam Green again. But yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> I guess, yeah, I guess we'll have to see. But no, I think you answered it great, Sarah. Um, I like how I'm saying that, but. Um, <laughs> okay. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, another question we have is, have you compared the abundance of different plankton species and other species in the community, such as fish, marine mammals? Ooh. Yeah, this is where we would really have to consult with uh, Dr. Carrie Culver uh, at UCSB and Scripps. Uh, she actually hired me on as an intern in the very beginning. And she was very interested in learning about how demoic acid and, and, and other harmful algal bloom events co-occur with other species and how that toxin builds up in the food web and then um, how that affects public health. And so, um, in her studies, I, I guess the take home is yes, harmful algal blooms do co-occur with other organisms like zooplankton or fish um, and marine mammals. 
and and when they do you know what are the impacts and so we have a marine mammal center here um i'm gonna get it wrong can someone correct me i think it's called simwe and it's incredible and they uh identify marine mammals during these events of stranding and when they're distressed um, and they're able to give that data to people like Carrie so they can understand the impacts of these blooms during that time. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, you did it. That's perfect. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. Probably have time for one or two more questions. Um, it looks like a little off topic, but an interesting one. It was, will the science art um, KCSB show come back? People are wondering about that in case you might know. Oh my God, who asked that? Oh, that's so good. Um, <laughs> a woman named Anne Barkett. Oh, sweet. Hey, Anne, what's up? Um, yeah, Sisters of the Blue. Yeah, that was fun. That was with Dr. Kelsey Bisson, who's now at Oregon State University. And um, we basically talked to scientists anywhere we could, you know, we're just like, can we give you a glass of wine and listen and hear about your uh, your work? And the answer is sadly no, but and I'll start a new podcast with you. Call me up. <laughs> I also, Lily, I saw a question by my friend Kelly Campbell, who is this very, very terrific local artist. Please look up her local murals. She used to work at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. Anyway, she's this, this wonderful graphic designer and illustrator. And um, she asked, is it safe to swim during these red tide events? And the answer is, um, it just, it depends on what you think of as safety. So for me, I think it's fine, honestly, to like, for example, the yes of toxin in the air isn't quite high enough to be deleterious to your health. That would be for the red tide El Poly event. Um, but for Sudanitia, it's still not clear. Like I'm doing several studies on this actually to learn what these metabolites do um, in all sorts of different scenarios for public health. But what I'm guessing for now is that it's okay to swim, but really the problem is for dolphins and sea lions, especially when they're consuming these um, uh, these fish or these shellfish products that have viscera that are so high in demoic acid or so high in toxicity that that's when things really start to affect their brain because it's a neurotoxin. But for swimming, I think, I think you're okay. But please consult with the California Department of Public Health because I could be wrong. <laughs> yeah, Sarah, I was going to say that you sort of answered that when you said that you went in to go swim in Ventura to go collect your data, but then I remembered, you know, you would probably do that even if it was dangerous, so. Yeah, that's so true, yeah. Well, see, like, I know the pandemic was really sad and I really feel for that time for everyone, my gosh, wow. But I really used that time to collect as much seawater as I could from the beach. And honestly, a bunch of, a bunch of lifeguards and police people helped me do it, honestly. The beaches were closed for a while, especially at Scripps, they like flat out just blocked it off with tape. And I was like, what? Anyway, I was that person, you know, in the waves, just scooping it up, checking it out. <laughs> anyway, I see we're over time, so I don't know. Yeah, I think, I think it is about that time. Um, but yeah, Sarah, thank you so much for this great talk. This was super fun. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, thanks, Lily, for being an awesome chat boss and question answer or asker and answerer on some of those. Um, and please, you know, come back, join us in June, June 13th for our next Science Pub from Home. Um, you can find more info on our museum website. Have a great night, everybody. Thank, Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you so Sarah. much. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Bye.